All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining today's Closer Look with the Lion Recovery Fund. Uh, you're in for a really fantastic next hour. Uh, I hope everybody's Friday is going really well. My name is Paul Thompson. I'm the Director of Conservation Programs for the Wildlife Conservation Network. Um, and I'm here today in San Francisco. And I'll be joined by my colleague in a minute, Pete Lindsay, who will be in uh, calling in from Europe at the moment. Uh, so yes, again, welcome to our Closer Look. These Closer Look webinars are designed to give you all a deeper dive into some of the programs here at WCN, the Wildlife Conservation Network. And today we're gonna to be focusing on lions and some of the work that we've been doing over the last five years. Uh, please, we really love hearing from you. So during the session, drop your questions into the chat. And at the end of the presentation, we are going to have um, an interactive uh, Q&A with Peter uh, to answer your questions. But first, let's take a quick step back and look at Lion Recovery overall. So the Lion Recovery Fund, we launched here at the Wildlife Conservation Network in 2017. So that means that this year is our fifth birthday. So it's a little milestone that we're all very excited about because in those five years, we've seen the LRF emerge as the largest funding mechanisms for lions ever. So in those five years, we've managed to raise and deploy almost $27 million to 196 projects across 23 countries in Africa, which is really remarkable considering also that WCN, we have a 100% model, meaning every donation to the LRF goes directly to lion conservation projects without WCN taking anything off the top. Now, the original idea for the LRF was to scale up the level of funding and support to lion conservation. And a key role that we like to play is um, performing due diligence on, on your behalf. So by donating to the Lion Recovery Fund, you can be sure that it's going to the most effective lion conservation projects uh, that are working to protect lions, protect their habitats, and protect their prey, which is all part of our strategy. So now I'm very excited to hand it over to Dr. Pete Lindsay, who has been with WCN leading the Lion Recovery Fund since 2017. Uh, Pete's based in Zimbabwe, his home country, um, although today he's, he's on the road, so he's uh, calling in from Europe. Um, and Pete really exemplifies the type of work we're doing in terms of bringing a lot of expertise to, uh, to the Lion Recovery Fund, as well as like a wide breadth of knowledge on, on different uh, regions, different projects, different strategies, things like that. So last month, was it last month? Maybe May, uh, time is kind of blurring. The two of us traveled to visit some of our partners in Central Africa. And today we're gonna to be focusing our presentation on this work that the LRF has been supporting in Central Africa. And I'm on a personal note, I'm just so excited for this update because that region, that part of the world is so incredible. It it's, represents such an importantly rich area for lion conservation and for biodiversity in general. And yet the challenges of working in that landscape are, are immense. But as you're about to find out, um, there's a lot of really, really inspiring work being done. Um, and we're really proud at the LRF to be able to support that work. Um, so again, please, please, please use the chat feature, say hi, say where you're from, but also along the way, uh, drop your questions in there so that we can answer them at the end. All right. Now, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, Pete. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, let me just share my screen here. Just give you one moment. There's a lot of slides there, but don't be afraid. They are mainly photographs. So nothing too, oh, heavens. Oh, oh, oh there we go. That's a little special start. Just give you one second. Uh, okay, hang on. Stop share. One moment, folks. Mm -hmm. Just bear with me, a little technical glitch. 
Okay, there we are. Okay, typical. Okay, there we are. Phew, I thought we had a major technical glitch, but it was a very minor one. So yeah, thanks very much for the introduction there, Paul. Much appreciated. Um, I, as Paul said, I'm Peter Lindsay, the director of the Lion Recovery Fund. Um, and I'm gonna to speak to you today about one of the projects that we've been supporting. So just to take a, a bit of a deep dive um, into this particular project, because it's a very exciting landscape that's perhaps not very well known. Um, and also represents perhaps, in my opinion, the, the most exciting uh, potential for lion recovery in the, in the whole of Africa, which I think is, is, is exciting and certainly the best uh, opportunity for securing the, the northern subspecies of, of African lions. Um, I, I am a particular expert in Central Africa, on Central African Republic, but we learned, you know, I've, I've learned a lot about the country before and, and after our visit there, but I have had the privilege of visiting a huge number of protected areas, I think 130 or so across 18 different African countries, and I have developed a, an understanding of what it takes to conserve lions. And so I want to relay some of my perceptions of, of that landscape. Um, but if any of you want to learn more about the country, you know, I can refer you to, to people who have much deeper expertise on, on what is an incredible country. So sit back and, and hopefully you'll enjoy. Oh. Okay, so this is a map of the human footprints in Africa. So even without that enormous arrow on the, on the screen, I think you could, you could see that there's a big area in, in the eastern side of Central African Republic with a very low human footprint. Um, and, and that's what makes the area so exciting. There's a massive wilderness area in Eastern Central African Republic, Eastern and Northern Central African Republic, extending into the, the Western reaches of South Sudan of about two, just over 200,000 square kilometers with very little human settlement indeed. So very, very little, which is, which is really remarkable. That's a massive area of about twice the size of, of Tennessee, about the size of Uganda, a really enormous area. And what makes it particularly special is that in, in Africa, most of the areas that have low densities of people are either arid or semi-arid, but Central African Republic is, is not. It's, most of it is, is quite high rainfall, it's fertile. And so this represents a really unique opportunity to, to conserve at scale a very high biodiversity area of land. From a lion conservation perspective, the area, as, as I'll go on to talk, is, um, is potentially critical. If you look at that distribution map of, of lions from Africa, which I must say still needs a lot of work, although a lot of work has been done on it, the big blob in the, in the northern hemisphere depicts the distribution of lions in eastern northern CAR and in South Sudan. Now, in reality, it's much more fragmented than that, but still lions do occur, particularly in, uh, in CA, CAR. Um, and as, as, as I'll go on to say, the recovery potential is quite significant. So in eastern and northern CAR, there are two main conservation NGOs operating. Wildlife Conservation Society and African Park. So WCS operate in the north of the country in the Bamingi, Bangaran and uh, Manovo, Gundas and Flores National Parks. They've got a mandate for a massive area of 100,000 square kilometers. And um, African Parks work in the east around in the Chinko landscape. Today I'm going to speak to you more about Chinko because African parks have been there for a lot longer than WCS. And so, you know, they're much further down the line. So both projects are very important, but today I'm going to focus on the AP one. They're both LRF grantees as well, I might add. So Eastern Star is, a, is an incredible landscape. It's, as I said, it's a vast wilderness. So Paul and I, who initially from Bangui to Bamengi in the north, and, and we saw very want to get out of the capital city, very few human signs. But then we flew three and a half hours in a caravan aircraft across towards Andre Felix National Park, which is in the kind of northeastern corner of the country, and then down to Chinko. And then in that three and a half hours, we saw two dirt tracks and one tiny human settlement. So it really is an incredible wild area. Um, it's a very diverse area. It's, it's, got a, it's got a rainfall gradient from about 700 mils to about 1,700 mils. Um, so you get you know, Congolian rainforest in the south, 
you get this kind of um, gallery forest along the numerous rivers, an incredible number of rivers there. And then you get this kind of uh, music, uh, Sudano, Ghanaian, Savannah. And then towards the north, you get more semi-arid kind of land. So it's very diverse. And this means the wildlife is very diverse. So you get wildlife that's characteristic of the forests, of, of savannas and of the kind of ecotone between the two, and which makes it a really special place. So examples of some of the iconic wildlife that occurs there are chimpanzees, bongo antelope, which is a, a really iconic, beautiful creature. Um, Lord Derby Eland, excuse these granular, these are camera trap photographs um, supplied by African parks. Um, but Lord Derby Eland, uh, savanna species, bongo is more of an ecotone species. Um, and then African wild dogs, another example. And what's interesting about wild dogs is that the esteemed wild dog conservationist and scientist Scott Creel published a paper in 1998 about the, the ecological factors limiting African wild dogs. And in that paper, he bemoaned the lack of landscapes of 100,000 square kilometers or, or more um, because he, he feels that, that that's the kind of landscape needed to, to secure that are as wide ranging as African wild dogs. But in his paper, he didn't recognize that wild dogs occurred in Eastern CAR or the landscape of that size actually does occur there. So wild dogs occurred there then in 1998 and they still occur there now. Quite a significant population, which is really exciting. Um, reflecting the fact that very little work has been done in that landscape, there's a lot of species that occur there that weren't recognized as occurring there. For example, the Central African slender snouted which is critically endangered. Um, they've, they've identified 556 bird species that are undoubtedly um, more than that, significantly more. And most of the, or not most, but a significant proportion of those were, were not known to occur there because no one had looked. Um, the area's got eight dica species, which just reflects how hyper biodiverse it is. It's got nine mongoose species, which I believe is a record for any particular area in Africa. Uh, it's got all four of the African pangolin species. It's got four small cat species, so African wildcats, serval, African golden cats, and caracals. And so these are just some examples of the kind of crazy biodiversity that occurs there. It's a really, really remarkable place. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a history of the recent threats to wildlife in Eastern CAR. There's been a series of wildlife collapses in, in the country, as I, as I understand it. The, um, the earlier collapses were associated with a colonial era and the, and the kind of slave trading period. Um, but so I'm going to focus more on the on the recent ones from the kind of 1980s onwards. And one of the significant factors has been armed poaching groups coming from neighboring countries. So in the 1980s and 90s, the Janju came from Sudan and uh, entered uh, Central African Republic and, and uh, were involved in very significant poaching, particularly for ivory to fund the war effort there, but also for bushmeat and other, other kinds of wildlife for various wildlife products. And that caused a major collapse in, in wildlife populations, major reduction in elephant numbers, the disappearance of black and white rhinos and the disappearance, at least from Eastern CAR of the giraffe. There are still a few giraffe left in the North, but they've gone, they've gone locally extinct in the East because of, of that particular era. Ongoing bushmeat trade is a, is a, a challenge. This, these are some tools that were removed by WCS and uh, up in, in the north of the country. So muzzle loading firearms and snares and gin traps. Although a lot of poaching for bushmeat is also done with automatic weapons, it has to be said. And one of the challenges of the bushmeat trade is a pervasive issue across a lot of Africa. Um, what never ceases to amaze me is how, how even in the most remote places, wildlife could be completely bushmeat poaching. Because even if there are no roads, it's possible to get it off the animals and then shoot animals there and dry the meat and pack it onto your motorbike. And as a result, um, as a result, the populations can be really uh, depleted in Central African Republic, as we have indeed in many other African countries. Um, the nomadic pastoralism has also been a significant threat as well, and also associated with a, with a 
at the third major collapse in, in wildlife populations in eastern CAR. So CAR, as I understand it, never had a, a um, historical, or should we say that cattle were never historically a prominent feature of CAR. And the reason for this is the country has a high prevalence of tsetse fly and panosomiasis, um, which is a, a disease that's fatal to cattle. And so for a long time, there were relatively few cows in the country. But that started to change over the last three decades or so with the onset or the availability of trypanocidal veterinary drugs that were subsidized by some development agencies that enabled um, herders to access CAR in a way that they had not been able to access them before. And so um, in addition, at the same time, during the partition of Sudan into Sudan and South Sudan, not uh, able to access South Sudan as easily as they used to be able to, and so they started to move into CAR. And so after a period of, of kind of 10 years or so of recovery between about 2000 and 2009 and 10, so from the end of the kind of poaching, large-scale poaching by the Janjaweed to the onset of the large-scale um, incursions by the Madagascarists, there was a recovery in wildlife populations, and then there was a very significant decline again because the 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 herders were associated with a lot of poaching for bushmeat, again, that would be transported out um, you know, on, on the back of donkeys and also targeting of carnivores with poison. So this is some of the kit carried by some of the, the herders, and you can see a little vial of, of poison. So that, that lion was poisoned to defend livestock. So um, some of the, one of the ecologists that was working in that over a long period um, took records of uh, based on small counts and other kind of metrics of the, the density of predators and other wildlife species and, and he recorded a very steep decline during 2012 to 2017 which is a, a period when the, the nomadic pastoralism was 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 occurring to a very significant extent hundreds of thousands of cows and, and lots of herders in that area with no control um, in the in the uh, protected part of, of the landscape or, or very little should we say. And the same trends were observed in the wild ungulate populations. And so what happened, so in the early 2000s, the area was mainly used for safari hunting. And there was a particularly far-sighted um, safari operator who along with a, an ecologist and a, a couple of their colleagues decided to try and create a conservation area that wasn't based on hunting, but was a, a conservation area. And they approached African parks to try and get them to engage in the area and take it on as one of their projects. And to cut a long story short, they agreed and were given a mandate to start working in the area in 2014. So that's when things started to turn around because all of a sudden there was, was a significant uptick in investment there. Um, and several years on now, the, the mandate that they have been given by the, the CAR government is 65,000 square kilometers in extent, which is a, a truly immense area, almost about almost 10 times the size of the Stone National Park. So that was when things started to turn around in about 2014. There are lots of challenges associated working in, in uh, Central African Republic. Um, it's a very unstable country. It's endured decades of, of instability, civil strife, um, you know, that's been through periods of the very severe, less severe, very severe. And, and, and it's still somewhat unstable, although it is a bit more stable than it's been for some time. And that creates all sorts of challenges for conservation. Um, this was reflected in, in 2012 when the headquarters of Manovo National Park was ransacked by rebel groups and the vehicles and, and buildings burnt. Um, there's a relatively weak rule of law in a lot of the country. And this is reflected in the fact that um, uh, in, in the capital city of Bangui is readily for sale on most street corners or, or uh, along the streets. And while the bushmeat trade is a significant problem across most of Africa, um, it's driven underground because there's some level of enforcement, but in CAR it's not, it's pretty public. Um, and of course, it's, it's a country that poses real logistical challenges because it's a big country with poor infrastructure and it's still unstable. So to give you an idea to drive to Chinko from Bangui takes a week in a land cruiser and the the um, the, the trucks that supply the, the area take three weeks to get there at best, excuse me. So that makes it both challenging and expensive to operate there. And so like African parks have to be extremely organized to, to make sure that, that they have enough food and, and supplies to 
to manage because getting resupplies is very difficult. This is a, a photo of part of their storeroom. And this is an enormous vat of peanut butter that's, um, that's been sourced from the, the scant local community. So there are no people actually in the Chinko area, but in the area to the south, there, there are some, some small communities. And, and this uh, peanut butter was, was purchased from them and is used to feed the staff there. So excuse this photo, this is from Zakuma. There are no, as I said, there are no giraffe in, uh, in Chinko, but it's a cool photo. Also, African Parks area just to the north and southern uh, Chad, well, quite far to the north and southern Chad. Um, but anyway, some of the key interventions that AP ha have undertaken, um, one is introducing anti-poaching security. So almost all field-based conservation projects in Africa require some level of, of anti-poaching, even the you know, real community-based projects do, but particularly in areas like this that are prone to armed incursions by rebel groups or by um, armed poachers from other countries, etc. you do need to have fairly robust law enforcement and uh, environmental policing, essentially. And so, so African parks have got that, and it's been a key part of, of exerting control in the area. And I've just got a very short video here, because when we were there, we had the pleasure of waking up every morning listening to the recruits go on, on training and they would sing these beautiful melodic songs. So let me give you 10 seconds of, of that. Hopefully you can hear it okay. Another key strategy has been engaging the um, the nomadic pastoralists. So, so African parks have chosen to do this in a very non-confrontational manner, which I think has been a, a real key to their success in the area. So, what they've done is they've they're creating transhumans or or nomadic pastoralist corridors that go around instead of through the protected areas. So. It's not like they're trying to ban or prohibit this pastoralism. It's trying to essentially align it. And so what they do or what their plan is to, to incentivize this is to, is, to, is to introduce some kind of veterinary interventions in the corridors to put some cattle corrals up so that the livestock are safe from depredation by lions at night, potentially put some water points in there. And then they also work with the communities to with the nomadic pastoralists to provide them with some key essentials that they can't get out in the bush. It's a very tough existence. And so providing salt and sugar and tea and some of these kind of essentials that they can't access miles from anywhere is, is, is much appreciated. And then they also work so that they, they, they hire these tango teams, which are these unarmed um, people of the same ethnic groups as the pastoralists to where they wear these very visible clothing to work with the pastoralists and inform them of the boundaries of the conservation area and of the location of the, of the corridors. And then they're also starting to work with the livestock owners in uh, Sudan, source countries, advising them of where the conservation areas are so that they can guide the livestock around them rather than through them as, as they did during those uh, five, six, seven years of, of uncontrolled uh, pastoralism in that area. So it seems to be working really well. The nomads seem to be very receptive to this and, and it's been, they've been able to make a difference in a manner that's, as I said, non-confrontational and, 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 and doesn't require force, which is, which is really heartening. Uh, this is an example of some of that's been put up to help people see where the boundaries of the conservation area are. And if to look at some of the progress that they've achieved, so five or six years ago, this, the, the green outline there is the outline of the Chinko conservation area and the dots are, are life curds and the orange lines are, are flight paths and five or six years ago they'd already created a fairly large area that was free of livestock and, and poaching but then if you move fast forward on to 2021 that area increased to about 25,000 square kilometers so where, where that was largely free of livestock vision thus also free of, of poaching, that providing wildlife with a really significant um, opportunity to recover. And as I said, this has also been accompanied with providing the herders with kind of alternative routes. There's also been an effort to engage communities, the communities that live to the south of the area through alternative livelihood programs, through support for education and health, of which you know, there's otherwise very, very little. 
um, employment and as I'll mention a bit later by helping to create a, an area of uh, security which is not to be underestimated. This is a, a map of the of Central African Republic showing the East Eastern CAR wilderness. Um, the, the luminous green blobs are the national parks in the country. The white is the area of largely un, uninhabited wilderness and the bluish turquoise blob is the Chinko conservation area. And so an important part of the work that African parks are doing is to work with local community, with pastoralists and with government to try and figure out land use plan to enable a kind of rational alignment of conservation uh, and other land uses, including the, the communities, resident communities to the south. And this has involved creating multiple use zones to allow for some kind of um, natural resource exploitation um, in those areas, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very important part of, of the planning, particularly for the future. So this is starting to demonstrate some real success. So if you look at these bars, the, the leftmost green bar is the densities of predators in 2012. Um, and then the red is in 2017, which was kind of at the end of those years of uncontrolled um, livestock incursions in, into the wildlife area. And then the bars thereafter are the years following that. So there's after a low in 2017, that's when things started to turn around and, and wildlife populations have recovered. Um, so predator numbers are going up and then also prey numbers are, are recovering too. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, the numbers of prey are almost back to what they were in uh, 2017. In some cases are now more, sorry, 2012. Some cases now more than they were then. So the area is really emerging now as a, as a stronghold for a variety of wildlife species. So in the greater Chinko area, they estimate there's about three and a half thousand chimpanzees, for example. Uh, 4,000 buffalo, increasing at perhaps 20% per annum, which is obviously very significant, something like that, plus minus. Uh, about 1,500 Lord Derby Eland. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how many of them are left in Cameroon, but so this, this is either the biggest population or the second biggest population, but I have no doubt that in, in, in shortly it will become the largest population of the species in the world remaining. Um, Two and a half thousand bongo is the estimate there, which is absolutely the largest protected population of this iconic species. And then the estimate for wild dogs very conservatively is about 100 individuals, but I'm, I'm sure that that's a major underestimate. And so if this population is not already the largest population in the Northern Hemisphere, um, it, it's, it very soon will become so. From a lion perspective, there's very conservatively 100 to 150 individuals and increasing uh, strongly with very substantial potential to increase further. And there are very significant social and economic benefits arising from this project. So, for example, um, the, the Chico project is the biggest taxpayer in Eastern CAR, it's the biggest employer, and it's created a, an island of security, as I, as I said, in a, in a, in a a context of great insecurity. So to the north, you've got Chad, you've got Sudan, you've got South Sudan, going around like that. And, and all of those countries, including CAR, are fairly unstable to a, a kind of greater or lesser degree. And through exerting control over this area, they've managed to, AP have managed to create an island of tranquility, essentially in a, in a sea of, of instability. And this has been really important from a human perspective. And this was evidenced by the fact that 200 and 55, I think it was, refugees entered the area and were housed and fed by African parks before being returned to their origin that, that once the threat had subsided. That is minus 30 or so people who were given permanent employment. There are, I think it's over 300 people in, employed in, in that area now. So, so some significant human benefits arising from that project too. And, and in my view, we just can't afford to miss this, the opportunity that is presented by Eastern CAR. And as I said, Northern CAR where WCS are working also offers incredible opportunity. The parks up there are, you know, the Manovo is a world heritage site and, and, and until you know, the mid 2000s was one of Africa's epic wildlife areas and there's enough wildlife there to recover. So these areas collectively could become real wildlife powerhouses in the future. It's realistic to hope for a, the recovery of at least a thousand lions there, if not more, which will effectively secure the future of the northern uh, subspecies of the African lion and make a significant contribution to the conservation of the species writ large. And there's potential to create many important hubs for other, for example, dogs here there. So a lot of the species that occur in Chinko are, are 
are not well protected elsewhere because elsewhere in their range because a lot of wildlife areas in Central and West Africa are very um, weakly protected. And that is starting to change now, it has to be said, but you know, that it's, it's an area where wildlife, wildlife is, is under a lot of pressure. And so it, it can be a real stronghold for a variety of species that are, are unique to that sort of Central African savanna. Um, and for species like wild dogs, for example, Chinko could potentially act as a hub to, to derive wild dogs when the population has recovered a little bit more to reintroduce into other areas when those areas have been protected properly. Um, the four pangolin species, to protect them all in a vast landscape like that pretty easily and effectively, I think is really exciting, etc. Bongo antelope, another, another example. Uh, ecosystem service is very significant. The carbon storage there is enormous, as you can imagine. And from a, a watershed protection uh, uh, perspective is very important too. There are the sources of seven major rivers that are partially or wholly encompassed in the Eastern Central African Republic wilderness. So <clears throat> including some of the tributaries for uh, Lake Chad, the Congo River and the Nile River originate in, in that area, some of the tri uh, tributaries. So it's a very important area. And so the human benefits from this area extend well beyond you know, the, the wilderness area itself. And of course, you know, by, by engaging with, with the different stakeholders and the government and doing proper land use planning, there's potential to kind of ensure that the various economic opportunities, such as the sale of, of ecosystem services and carbon, potential tourism one day, okay, it doesn't seem realistic now, but maybe in future, um, uh, you know, the, the land rights uh, of the local resident communities and, and having properly aligned and sustainable nomadic pastoralism, et cetera, can all potentially be secured in a way that perhaps isn't the case if everything is allowed to just kind of unravel and, and, and um, without any kind of order or control. And a significant factor is that because this area is very empty and because the, the borders are porous, and because there's a big lack of governance otherwise, I think in the absence of this kind of conservation effort, it's, it's a real likelihood that there'd be a lot of sort of ad hoc random settlement from neighboring countries, <clears throat> which, would, which would cause uh, foreclosure of some of the conservation potential. As I said, it's it's Africa's largest wilderness area outside of the desert biome, and, and there's no significant proportion of this can't be secured. In terms of our support, LRF support for Africa, <coughs> we've um, well, I say we LRF has provided them with uh, 1.15 million dollars of funding so far. Our last grant to them enabled them to extend their management by about 5,000 square k's, which is more than half the size of Yellowstone. And so we're going to continue to support their work there because they're doing a fantastic job. And then also uh, with WCS, we provided a starter grant of about $300,000 to help them get started up there. And we are going to look to continue to support their efforts um, as, as they hope to secure the area um, going forward. So I just want to say thanks for listening. I know that was a lot. I was speaking quite quickly. If you have any questions, uh, please fire them away. And I just want to say thanks to all of you for listening and to every single one of our supporters. A point to note is that 100% of every donation to the LRF makes it to the field to projects like this. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Pete. Um, all right. Great, that was that was awesome. Now we are going to answer some of the questions that were asked along the way. Um, to kick things off, Pete, just tell us a little bit about you know as part of your job, it is to go out and and speak with conservationists, doing effective conservation projects all over the continent. And part of that is going to visit these projects uh, firsthand and learn about the issues yourself. So coming from a, a trip like this one, like how, how important is it to conduct that type of site visit? What, what's the sort of difference that you are able to gather from that that you take away? Yeah, no, I, th I think it's I think it's essential uh, for a number of reasons. I mean, it's 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 easy for conservation groups today doing A, B, and C, but one has to go there to make sure that the the, you know, the claims are being reflected on, on the ground. Um, it's important to go there and see really what the what the future prognosis is for conservation there and what the potential is. And it's also important to go there and share some of the lessons learned from other sites around the continent and, and connect people with other conservation projects so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel the whole time. And so I think it's a critical part of, of the job, but it also helps that it's a really enjoyable part. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so maybe starting with a lion focused question, we had a question from Elizabeth about the local population in 
in Central African Republic. So maybe you could just recap sort of what sort of lion numbers we're seeing in that Chinko area and in those national parks, um, and whether you think that that's sort of enough to uh, secure a functional population. Or, as Elisabetta asks, do you think that some translocations bringing lions into other areas like Akagera National Park in Rwanda might be part of the equation? No, I mean, certainly in Chinko, that's not necessary. Um, that, you know, so the ecologist there, Terry Abisher, estimates that there's 100 or 150 at least, and, and I'm certain there's more than that. Um, and so, I, you know, that's a more than big enough found of population. Um, in the north, in the parks in the north, we have no idea how many lions are left there. They're, they're definitely there. Um, we don't know how many. But again, I think there's, a, excuse me, enough to not worry about reintroductions. There might need to be the reintroductions of other species that have gone missing, giraffe, for example, or cob. You know, cob are on the very edge of extinction in uh, much of CAR because they're so easy to approach. So okay. they need to be reintroduced augmented yeah so so on the topic of lines we just got a question in um from nkabang that who asks what sort of monitoring is taking place with those lines yeah good question so it's it's a massive landscape with not that many roads and so it's super challenging it's very wet for a lot of the time so they do some camera trapping limited camera trapping and they do they do i think they've got a couple of collars out and but mainly spore counts to kind of assess trends in populations of wildlife species which is pretty coarse we, you know it's, it's not the best method and so i think over time there is going to be a case for doing structured camera trapping grids um which i think would help a lot but i hope that answers the, the question yeah and then uh kind of shifting gears to you spoke a lot about how lions are serving this role of being an umbrella species that um, conservation of lions can protect by extension other species that share those landscapes. So can you can you share a little bit more about what we're seeing in regards to that in that area? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a big part of, of the philosophy of the Lion Recovery Fund is we try not to be too one eyed about lions. You know, the idea is to protect these savanna landscapes. Um, but it also helps that, the, you know, the, the most important intervention for conserving lions is supporting the management of these under or not unmanaged uh, conservation areas out there. And so it is normally the case that if you support the management of these areas and the protection and the anti-poaching and the community engagement and so forth, generally speaking, lions just recover, uh, as does everything else as well, wild dogs, the, the prey species, other carnivores, etc. Um, in some cases where the threats are very lion specific, such as where there's lots of lion poaching or whether there's hu human lion conflict, that's where you really need the very lion specific interventions. And so we do fund a lot of that as well. But we fund both of the big landscape stuff that's quite general. And then within that, we try and get organizations to have a bit more of an eye on lions, especially where there's lion specific threats. So there's a question here from Antoinette who asks if there are any elephants in the area. Uh, so I'm not sure if you have any of those figures recorded about yeah. the sort of the elephant numbers, but maybe you can touch on that. Yeah, I, I do. Thanks. Thanks for checking, Paul. Um, so so the, the elephants got really hammered you know, by the, the Sudanese poachers and really pushed to the edge of extinction. Um, but there are a few more elephants than, than um, was previously thought. There's about 80 individuals in there, which is not many, but... You know, as, as Peter Fernhead, the, the African Parks head guy, points out that when Kruger was formed, there, was, there were fewer elephants than that in Kruger, and now they're up, I don't know, 20,000 or something there. So there's a founder population there. Maybe it'll need augmenting at some stage, but there's enough to work with. But certainly they got hammered right, right down. Mm. Yeah, and it's, it's worth noting that on this trip, we were accompanied by uh, Chris Thaulis, Dr. Chris Thaulis, who is the head of the Elephant Crisis Fund. And so that is a sister fund to the Lion Recovery Fund. Um, and he, he joined us on this site to sort of see if there's an opportunity for supporting elephant conservation in this landscape. 
Um, and that is a good transition to one of Christina's questions, who asks about the sort of the, the number of different species in the landscape and whether there's work between uh, our different programs to support those different species within um, sort of this common landscape. So I'm, I'm happy to take that one, Pete, or, or you can give it a go. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, so at WCN, we do have this, um, we do have a, a suite of programs that are single species in focus, like the Lion Recovery Fund, like the Elephant Crisis Fund I met, just mentioned, as well as the Rhino Recovery Fund and a Pangolin Crisis Fund. And although they are framed as single species in focus, they are providing a more landscape level approach to conservation, uh, just as, as Pete described earlier, to have that multifaceted effect for, for landscapes, as well as um, the variety of biodiversity within them. So what we try to do as much as possible is to uh, leverage the strength of each of the different funds or programs at WCN so that we can have that much more comprehensive um, and, and larger impact. And what we've done in many cases is co-grant. So grants from two different programs going to support the same project that will allow that, that partner or project to be able to tackle uh, common issues for, for multiple species. You have anything to add to that, Pete? No, I think that, yeah, I think we got it. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so we've, this is great. We've got a lot of really good questions coming in. So uh, we're going to keep tackling through the or going through these. Um, the question from Matt early on about the level of livestock presence in the area, specifically, as we kind of flew over some of that wide open space um, around Andre Felix National Park, but maybe you can just talk, touch, go back to that about um, livestock presence within the core area and sort of some of these corridors that they're creating to encourage people to take livestock outside of those core areas. Yeah, I mean, we didn't see a lot of livestock on, on that big flight in, but there are huge numbers of, of livestock that are moving in and out of CAR, you know, in the kind of hundreds of thousands um, order, of, order of magnitude. Um, but the areas are, are vast and, and they, they, these movements are, are seasonal. Um, and so I think there is significant potential for creating corridors, especially, I think, by working with the owners of the livestock in the source country so that, you know, kind of coordinating it. So, you know, we, did, we saw huge areas where we can see any livestock, but you know, the, they move in enormous herds. And it's like buffalo. I don't know how familiar you are with with, with seeing buffalo in a protected area. There could be a lot of them and you don't see them, you don't see them, you don't see them, and then you see a massive herd. And it's kind of like that with these nomadic cats. Of course, the numbers are much higher than the buffalo numbers. Um, so for ages without seeing any, and then you just see them. Um, so yeah, big areas, uh, huge numbers of livestock. It can work, but they need to be properly aligned. Cool. Uh, so early on, also, David asked a question about what's the likelihood of having the wilderness, and I think he means Chinko, um, being designated as a conservancy or park. So maybe just kind of run through the, uh, the plan with Chinko in terms of, of, of formalizing it to giving it uh, protected area status. Yeah, so I mean, it does have some status at the moment, but but they are looking to to work with government to um, to raise its status to national park, but then also to have some kind of um, <clears throat> semi protected area status around it that you know that that where there are kind of lesser protected areas around it, including some kind of community utilization zones to the south. <clears throat> so the hope is that it will be upgraded eventually, which I think would be would be a fantastic win because it definitely merits it. It's, uh, it's an unreal area. It really is. Yeah. Um, Nkabang asked another question around uh, community conservation. So are there interventions or engagements with communities regarding those human wildlife interactions? Um, and to what extent is that a, an issue or concern? So maybe you can, can recap um, what we saw with those tango teams. Yeah, I mean, you, you could touch on that as well, but I, I would say, so I would say that firstly, there's no resident communities living in Chinko, which is, which is pretty um, unusual to have an area of that size. Um, and also wildlife populations, they're recovering, but they're still quite depressed. And, and the, the key 
conflict-causing species, elephants, um, are, are, are so scarce as to be a non-issue. Um, and lions are still scarce. And so human-wildlife conflict, I don't think is particularly severe. Um, you know, there, there is going to be some work with the nomads. They're not resident communities. They're actually people by and large from neighboring countries. But to, to help to reduce the conflict by putting up corral, corral, corrals, as we call them, in the corridor areas around the wildlife area. But am, am I missing anything there, Paul, on that topic? No, I, no, I think that that covers it. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of some of those alternative income opportunities that are sprouting up on the edges of the park as well. Um, but yeah, and then so so next question, we've got uh, two questions, one from David and one from uh, Leandra, who, who is asking about tourism. So uh, what sort of tourism are they seeing in in that area? And I can touch on that one. So in Chinko at the moment, African Parks is trialing a potential tourism opportunity. So given given the state of the area now and how much insecurity there has been historically, the area is not exactly well set up for tourism at the moment, certainly not on the same level as what, we're, what we see in East Africa or Southern Africa. But the hope is there that if the, the land can be put under effective management and those wildlife numbers come back, then yes, bringing in tourism would be a really uh, great source of additional income um, for conservation and for those local communities. Right now they are in, in the Chinko area, their African Parks is trialing a um, very cool initiative whereby they have a small mobile camp on the Chinko River set up for uh, fishing of something called the Goliath tigerfish, which after I learned about this species, I, I quickly fell in love because it is truly a Goliath beast of a fish um, that's something like two meters long, six feet long with dinosaur-like teeth. And apparently people can go there and, and like fly fishing style, catch them. Um, and then that brings in a lot of uh, valuable uh, revenue for the area. So they're working on it. And hopefully it's something that can become an additional source of support for, for the area. Yeah, I mean, Paul, I, maybe I just want to say something um, as well. It's not answer to a question, but, you know, Chinko, so a Africa is an incredible continent, absolutely incredible. Right? I just love it. And as we know, there are all these amazing wildlife areas in southern East Africa that a lot of us who are into wildlife are very familiar with. But around Africa, you know, there's lots of un, like unknown places within those regions, but also in Western Central Africa that are very little known, absolute gems of, of areas with this incredible potential. And I think the story with African conservation is often so negative, but actually this, in my eyes, the story is one of real potential. There's these gems like Chinko that with the right level of management and sufficient investment, can become incredible conservation success stories. So what we're trying to do is find as many areas like this as possible, and get investment to, to the best projects in these kind of areas and help them recover and become and fulfill their potential before we lose them. Because a lot of these areas, otherwise we might lose before people even realize how amazing they were, if, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe switching gears slightly, we have a question from Leandra about, um, Conservation in the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, uh, which was an area that we visited following our trip to the Central African Republic. Um, the question is, could you try some of these conservation strategies in other protected areas um, in DRC where poaching is still high? Uh, so Pete, maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the work that, um, that we saw in, on, across the border in DRC. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing I'd say is that the the engagement with nomads is, you know, around the nomadic pastoralism is something that you know has been really worked on a lot in Chinko. And there's a lot because that as a as a, a lifestyle is prevalent across the Sahel and a lot, and it's a big challenge for protected areas across the Sahel. And so you know, learning from the lessons in Chinko, I think they can be applied and adapted to the local scenario across the Sahel. There, there, there is pastoralism um, as an issue around some of the protected areas in DRC, but as you rightly point out, poaching is a big issue. And so the, the project that we visited in, in Garamba, so it's, you know, it's N equals one of the protected areas in DRC, but there was a lot more 
emphasis on anti-poaching as opposed to the pastoralism issue. Um, a, a lot more intensive a, a wildlife area with much more kind of severe threats. Uh, but also another story where wildlife is, is recovering and there's a, at least a stable lion population there. Paul, do you want to add something to that? <clears throat> yeah, no, I think you well covered it. Um, again, I think the region is, is such a critically important area, not just for lions, but other species like we talked about earlier, like elephants, which, you know, DRC has ex been exposed to a massive amount of elephant poaching over time. And now we're seeing DRC be an important area for um, the trafficking of other illegal wildlife products like pangolins and their scales. So I think having this, this regional approach is really important. And again, this also goes back to what I mentioned earlier about working across our different programs. So for example, in the Garumba area, that's where our, our sister fund, the Elephant Crisis Fund, has been investing a lot of work to stem the poaching in Garumba. Uh, okay, next up we have, let's see here. Um, yeah, here's a really interesting question about um, the notion of, of wilderness. So, you know, wilderness, the, the term wilderness has become a bit of a um, sort of a, a hot topic at the moment because there's many different, different definitions of wilderness. And as you saw in the beginning of, of Pete's uh, presentation, uh, we showed a map of where Chinko falls on the continent. And that was map that included data, satellite data, uh, things like development, like roads and fires. And here we're defining wilderness as an area that is without that type of development. So, so no major industrial development, no artisanal mines or things like that, no agriculture, no human settlement. Um, and that's why this area is, is also critically important because it's one of those few remaining intact wilderness areas um, that can be put under effective conservation management. Pete, do you have anything to add to that notion of, of, of wilderness in, in modern Africa? Yeah, I know, I know that in a way it's a, a loaded term and lots of different types of, of wilderness, but I think this, it's, it's Eastern CAR's wilderness in the pure sense of the, of the word. So yeah. Uh, I'm not to add to that. Yeah, cool. Um, okay, here's a question from Greg. Are there any efforts to keep the animals in the CAR from going into South Sudan where they might be in further danger? So maybe you could talk about, yeah, sort of some of the relationship of this transboundary area between CAR and, and South Sudan and, and maybe some of the work that we're doing across the border in South Sudan. Yeah, I mean, so South Sudan has also got um, enormous conservation potential too. It's a, it's one of, it's another of, of Af it's, it's an incredible country actually. It's got enormous wildlife migration still persist in, in eastern South Sudan. It's got massive protected areas, including the Southern National Park in, in the southwest of the country. And that's a project where we've been supporting um, the management of through uh, Fauna International. And so there's a lot of potential there. And, um, you know, it's, it's not a, the narrative is not one way it's wildlife is unsafe on one side of the border and safe on the other, you know, it's relatively safer in the, in the, in the conservation area than outside of it. Um, you know, the, what South Sudan needs is, is more investment in its conservation areas that, than it's, it's currently receiving, but it's, I tell you, it's a country with incredible potential too. It really is. Mm. And then switching gears over to Nigeria. So Ufua asked uh, or said, we have a few lions left in Nigeria and there's so little knowledge and know-how um, on their conservation and to recover them. What can be done or what is being done uh, for lions in Nigeria? Yeah, good question. So there are lions in Yankari National Park. There's a, a few, I don't, we don't know how many, but um, so there's a partnership between Wildlife Conservation Society and the Nigerian government for the management of that park. And so we've been investing in supporting that project and also in, 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 a, in the management, we're also gonna uh, support monitoring of the lions to, to allow for more focused protection. Um, but then in, in the other park, sorry, excuse me, the other park with lions, Kayenji Lake National Park also has lions, but there's no <coughs> NGO working in there. And if I was the Nigerian government, I would work hard to try and attract a, 
an NGO partner through a kind of public-private partnership to introduce significant funding and, and management to support the efforts of the government. Because what we see around Africa is generally that you know governments have a very strong political will for conservation, but they're confronted with a lot of competing developmental needs. And so often the budgets are not, and all the African countries are often set aside these massive protected area networks. And they just, the wildlife authorities just don't have the budgets to manage these areas, which is not really any fault of their own. And so these public-private partnerships can offer real potential to shore up the management. And so for Kayenji Lake, if I was the Nigerian government, I would try and find a PPP partner to help manage the park. <coughs> Excuse me. So unfortunately, we're really getting close on time and there's a few questions in here left. So unfortunately, we're not gonna get to them all. Um, but if we don't answer your question, or if you do have any follow-up, please reach out to us, email megan at wildnet.org, and we're going to get to that. But uh, for now, Pete, I think one more question for you. Um, and this touch, this is coming from Leandra, who is asking about um, bushmeat and sort of uh, disease implications for that. So given in your presentation and what we saw in Central Africa, we saw the bushmeat poaching to be a significant uh, threat facing biodiversity in that area. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about bushmeat trends across the continent, even if you wanna take it out to that level, and then also implications for, for human health as well. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think bushmeat poaching personally is, a, is presently the number one threat facing lions and, and wildlife in general. Across Africa is a huge issue massive issue and, and, and both inside and outside of protected areas. Um, and, you know, the, the nature of the bushy trade, the drivers kind of vary from area to area. Um, it's, it's a huge issue from a nature conservation perspective. It's a big issue from a human health perspective for, for two reasons. Firstly, because uh, people have, for millennia have depended upon bushmeat for as a protein supplement, but, but in many areas, wildlife is disappearing, so it can't play that role. And then also because of the um, zoonoses or, or the diseases that are transmissible between wildlife and humans, particularly when primates are consumed. And so in Central Africa, that is, is a real concern. And so, so I think there's a, bush meat's a wicked problem. Uh, it's a very complicated kind of development, developmental related issue and requires multifaceted solutions to tackle that we don't have time to deal with right now, but it's a challenge. All right. Thank you so much, Pete. Um, I hope all of you out there appreciated this deeper dive and closer look into uh, some of the work that we're supporting through the Lion Recovery Fund. Um, we're going to have to end it here today, but I definitely want to say a huge, huge thank you to all of you for spending your time with us today, as well as supporting the LRF if you have done so. Um, we really rely on your support to make sure that we are out there helping to recover lions across Africa. Join us for our next uh, Closer Look, which is going to be held on Friday, July 29th at 12 p.m. Pacific time. That's going to be a really exciting one also because that will be featuring WCN's two newest partners, the Rwanda Wildlife Conservation Association and the Conservation Through Public Health, which works with gorillas and health issues in Uganda. So you've got two locally led conservation organizations that are doing really fantastic work in Rwanda and Uganda. So please tune in to learn more about those programs. Um, again, thank you all so much. Please stay safe, have a wonderful weekend, and we'll be in touch. Cheers. Thank you very much, guys.